Our Lady of Guadalupe. Here are some quotes by famous Mexicans, Octavio Paz, one of Mexico's greatest writers and thinkers. After two centuries of experiment and failure, the Mexican people only believe in the Virgin of Guadalupe, the national lottery. Carlos Fuentes, you cannot truly be considered a Mexican unless you believe in the Virgin of Guadalupe. Rosario de Leon in Woman Hollering Creek and Other Stories. Sandra Cisneros. I finally understood who you are. No longer Mary the Mild, but our mother Tonancin, your church at Tepeyac built on the site of her temple. And here is the famous renowned Tilma or Cloak of Guadalupe that you can still see today in her basilica at Tepeyac, Mexico City. This is the Tilma that is said to have been given um, by the Virgin Mary, Virgin of Guadalupe, the Lady of Guadalupe, to Juan Diego. Before we get into the Virgin of Guadalupe, I want to uh, um, give my definition, a definition of culture. Culture includes the beliefs, knowledge, and customs of a particular group of people characterized by time and place, encompassing shared language, religion, food, social habits, music and the arts, heroes and myth and history. Culture unites a people, distinguishing them as unique from other groups. Culture may be tied to geographic region, to a particular time in history, and to ethnicity or race in any of these combinations. Culture may spread out broadly, binding together a modern nation state, as in the Mexican culture or Brazilian culture. Smaller groups, have more, moreover, within nation states may have their own cultures, as in the Appalachian, Mennonite, or Chicano culture. Culture is rarely stagnant. Culture flows like a river through time and geography, morphing into new customs and beliefs. Here is the banner that Hernan Cortez used during the conquest of Mexico. So imagine Cortez lands in Veracruz in 1519, an army of a roughly four to 500 um, Span Spaniards, mostly young men looking for gold and adventure, um, who had just come out of the Reconquista, hundreds of years of fighting against Islam. And they bring this great zeal, this medieval um, knightly zeal to Mexico. They believe they're fighting the devil. Um, and they march under a banner of Mary, the same way they marched under her um, during the Reconquista. And she, in, in this fashion, she's like a warrior. She's a powerful, she's a powerful god. When the indigenous people look on Cortez's banner, um, they, would have, they would have seen Mary as the prime god of, of the Spanish. She obviously has the sun behind her. Um, the sun god is um, something that the natives worshipped and revered, um, sacrificed to. So Mary is crowned with the sun and the stars, and she is leading Cortez um, to conquer um, native, native peoples and eventually Tenochtitlan in 1521. You can still see this banner in Mexico City today. And if you read the Spanish around it, it says, this is the banner which was carried uh, by um, Don Fernando Cortez in the conquest of Mexico. Here are some dates. Not too many to bore you, but in 1519, Hernan Cortez lands at Veracruz, the place of the true cross. In 1521, Cortez conquers the Mexica capital city, Tenochtitlan, the Mexica, of course, also known as the Aztecs. In December 1531, only 10 years after the conquest of Tenochtitlan, the Virgin of Guadalupe is said to have appears to the Nahua commoner 
Juan Diego at Tepeyac, where a shrine to the Mexican or Mexica goddess Tonantzin once stood. A church to the Virgin is built on that spot. So of course, um, like most civilizations and cultures around the world, um, the Mexica had mother goddesses. And that's the closest term we can come to describing what they had. They may have described her in different ways, but it's, it's, it's a common attribute of, of cultures and civilizations around the world to have a female figure that represents fertility, the earth, the power of the feminine and divine. And Tonantzin um, represented this to the Mexica, a mother goddess, a powerful mother goddess, very similar to a Mary at this time. If you look at your European and Western history, Mary herself at this time is an evolution um, dating back to the early mother goddesses of Mesopotamia and the Mediterranean that will eventually evolve into Diana um, and, and the goddesses of the Greeks and Romans and morph into um, the Mexican Guadalupe. 1961, Pope John the 13th calls the Virgin of Guadalupe the mother of the Americas. She's also um, the queen of Mexico. In 2002, Juan Diego, um, the, the, the Nahua commoner, who is said to have received the apparition of the Virgin Mary, is made into a saint. He's canonized by Pope John II. Here's a picture of um, Don Fernando Cortez, also, of course, named um, called Hernando or Hernan Cortez. Here is an image, an actual um, figurine of Tonantzin. Tonantzin was the Mexica, was the Mexica goddess. Um, her one of her names to the Aztecs, the Mexica, was our sacred mother. Very similar to the names that Mary possesses at this time during the conquest throughout European history. And even today, Mary is the sacred mother um, to Catholics. And you can go see this today, in the National Museum of Anthropology in Mexico City. When I was in my early 20s, I had a chance to travel throughout Mexico. And I, and um, my first time there, when I was around 24, um, astounding, one of the greatest museums in the world. And if any of you can get down there, um, air travel is cheap to Mexico. And so is the conversion rate. You get many pesos for your dollar. Go and see this museum. There's so many wonderful artifacts in this museum. Here are some names of Mary, right? So our sacred mother for Tonantzin. And these are only a few names that Mary has. Her, her list goes on um, far more than these names here. Holy Mary, Mother of God, Queen of Heaven, Mother of God, Mother of Mercy, Mother of Sorrows, Stars of the Sea, Our Lady. And many of these names actually predate Mary and go back to Isis and Astarte and Diana um, before um, the New Testament was even written, before the historical Mary, if, if we believe the Gospels, if there was a historical Mary, before she lived, these names were um, the names of other goddesses before Mary. More than Jesus or Santiago Matamoros, St. James, a Muslim killer, Mary acted as a Spanish war god during the Reconquista and conquest of Mexico. She was a general. Mary led her troops against Islam in Spain, and against satanic forces in the new world. Of course, when I read this, I'm not saying I believe this. This is what she represented to the people of the time period, right? The conquistadors believed they were fighting the, the, the devil in Mexico. And it was uh, one of the greatest ironies and coincidences in history that the Spanish believe that God is leading them to conquer Mexico, and what do they see when they get there? They see statues of the, the feathered serpent deity, Quetzalcoatl. And they see bloodstained altars. And of course, throughout European history, the devil is represented as a dragon, right? 
So this reconfirms in the minds of the Spanish conquistadors that they're there, that God has led them there to fight the devil. So, and again, satanic forces in the new world against the Aztecs and other indigenous cultures who the Spanish believed were under the spell of the devil. Mary's role during the conquest was so powerful that she was quickly adopted by native peoples as a syncretic, powerful mother goddess in the guise of Our, Guadalupe, Our Lady of Guadalupe. A combination, now she's a combination of the Nahuatl deity Tonantzin and the European Mary, Mother of God. We have a combination occurring in Mexico. Now, this phenomenon had occurred for the last nearly 1500 years throughout Europe as Christianity, Catholicism spread throughout Europe. Um, oftentimes, Catholicism um, incorporated the local gods in customs of the people and gave it Christian names. Um, Christmas, for example, and Easter, the youthful um, Apollo became Jesus. There's actually a statue um, that was found below the Vatican that was a statue of Apollo. The name of Apollo is crossed out and the name Jesus is inserted over. This happens throughout Europe. And this happens in Mexico also. So here's Mary on the left, the European Virgin Mary, and a stone figure again of Tonantzin on the right that you can go see in Mexico City. Both, both goddesses, and I, as a story, I am going to call Mary a goddess, even if your Catholic faith doesn't allow you to. Um, she, in all her mannerisms, is a goddess according to my historical knowledge, um, that's how she acts um, and behaves with, to her faithful as, as a deity. So here's a breakdown, um, quite simple. Um, the, the European Virgin Mary, the Spanish Virgin Mary, um, plus Tonantzin, the Nahua Tonantzin, equals um, Guadalupe, the Mexican um, version of the Virgin Mary. And um, the Guadalupe is the Virgin Mary appearing to um, early colonial Mexicans only a few years after the conquest. That's what the sources say. And you can see here, she is clothed with the sun, the rays of the sun, um, the same way and very similar to how Mary over here was clothed with the sun on Cortez's banner. Power, powerful image. Now let's just read a few excerpts from um, an original source that details um, the appearance of the Virgin Mary, the Virgin of Guadalupe um, to Juan Diego. Colantoensin, I know I'm not pronouncing that as correctly as possible, was one of the first Aztec men or Mexica men, this was Juan Diego, to convert to Christianity after the Spanish conquest of Tenochtitlan in Mexica, Mexica. Renamed as Juan Diego, he soon reported an appearance of the Virgin Mary at a place just north of Mexico City called Tepeyac. Now, of course, uh, at that time, it was north of Mexico City. Now it's right in the center of Mexico City. Um, I've been there. I visited this. I visited Tepeyac in 2019, and it was a powerful experience. Um, I'm not a religious person. I was in my 20s, but I'm not anymore. Um, but um, it, it, it was a, it was a it's a place of power, um, and I, I invite any any of you and all of you to take a plane and go visit Tepeyac. Visit. Um, the old Tenochtitlan, the Plaza Mayor, go to Teotihuacan, experience these great places of power in, in Mexican history and Latin American history. Going back to the, to the um, original source, this apparition became an important symbol for new native Christianity. The following excerpts are translated from an account first published in Nahuatl by Luis Lazo de la Vega in 1649. Here is um, the, the episode of the apparition of the Virgin Mary to Juan Diego. On a Saturday just before dawn, 
Juan Diego was on his way to pursue divine worship and to engage in his own errands. As he reached the base of the hill known as Tepeyac, came the break of day, and he heard singing atop the hill, resembling singing of very, very beautiful birds. He then heard a voice from above the mountain saying, Juanito, Juan Dieguito. Then he ventured and went to where he was called. He was not frightened in the least, on the contrary, overjoyed. Then he climbed the hill to see from where he was being called. When he reached the summit, he saw a lady who was standing there and told him to come hither. Approaching her presence, he marveled greatly at her superhuman grandeur. Her garments were shining like the sun. The cliff where she rested her feet had pierced with glitter, resembling an anklet of precious stones, and the earth sparkled like the rainbow. The mesquites, nopales, and other very different weeds which grew there appeared like emeralds, their foliage like turquoise, and their branches and thorns glistened like gold. He bowed before her and he heard her word, tender and courteous, like someone who charms and esteems you highly. She said, Juanito, the most humble of my sons, where are you going? He replied, my lady, I have to reach your church in Mexico, Tlatelolco, to pursue divine things taught and given to us by our priest, delegates of our Lord. She then spoke to him, no one understand well, you the most humble of my son, that I am the ever virgin holy Mary, mother of the true God for whom we live, of the creator of all things, Lord of heaven and the earth. I wish that a temple be erected here quickly, so that I may therein exhibit and give you all my love, compassion, hope, and protection, because I am your merciful mother to you, and to all the inhabitants of this land and all the rest who love me, invoke and confide in me. Listen there to their lamentations and remedy all their miseries, afflictions, and sorrows. Then he descended to go to comply with the errand and went to the avenue which runs directly into Mexico City. The bishop did not give credence and said that he could not do what Juan had asked based only on his request. In addition, a sign was necessary so that he could, he could be believed that he was sent by the true lady of heaven. When Juan Diego was to carry a sign so he could be believed, he failed to return because when he reached his home, his uncle named Juan Bernardino had become sick and was gravely ill. On Tuesday before dawn, Juan Diego came from his house to talk to local to summon a priest. When he rounded the hill going around so he could not be seen by her who sees well everywhere, he saw her descend from the top of the hill and was looking toward where they previously met. She approached him at the side of the hill and said to him, what's there, my son? Where are you going? He replied, know that your servant of yours is very sick, my uncle. He has contracted the plague and is near death. After hearing Juan Diego speak, the most holy virgin answered, hear me and understand well, my son the least, that nothing should frighten or grieve you. Let not your heart be disturbed. Do not fear that sickness, nor any other sickness or anguish. I am not here. Wait, am I not here? Who was your mother? Are you not under my protection? Am I not your health? Am I not happily within my fold? Are you not happily within my fold? What else do you wish? Do not grieve nor be disturbed by anything. Do not be afflicted by the illness of your uncle, who will not die now of it. Be assured that he is now cured. And then his uncle was cured, as it was later learned. When Juan Diego heard these words from the lady from heaven, he was greatly consoled. He was happy. He begged to be excused, to be off to see the bishop, to take him the sign or proof, 
so that he might be believed. The lady from heaven ordered to climb to the top of the hill where they previously met. She told him, climb my son the least to the top of the hill. There you will, there where you saw me and I gave you orders. You will find different flowers. Cut them, gather them, assemble them, then come and bring them before my presence. He immediately went down the hill and brought the different roses which he had cut to the lady from heaven, who, as she saw them, took them with her hand and again placed them back in its hill and was saying, my son, this diversity of roses is the proof and the sign which you will take to the bishop. You will tell him in my name that he will see in them my wish that he will have to comply to it. You are my ambassador, most worthy of all confidence. The bishop realized that Juan Diego was carrying the proof to confirm what the Indian requested. Immediately, he ordered Juan Diego's admission. As he entered, Juan Diego knelt before him, as he was accustomed to do, and again related what he had seen and admired, also the message. He unfolded his white cloth where he had had the flowers, and when they scattered on the floor all the different varieties of roses de Castilla, suddenly there appeared the drawing of the precious image of the ever virgin Holy Mary, the mother of God, in the name as she is today kept in the temple of Tepeyac, which is named Guadalupe. As Juan Diego pointed out the spot where the lady from heaven wanted her temple built, he begged to be excused. He wished to go home to see his uncle Juan Bernardino. As they arrived, they saw that his uncle was very happy and nothing ailed him. He was greatly amazed to see his nephew so accompanied and honored, asking the reason of such honors conferred upon him. His nephew answered that he, his nephew answered that when he had went to the summon of priests to hear his confession and to absolve him, the lady from heaven appeared to him at Tepeyac telling him not to be afflicted, that his uncle was well, for which he was greatly consoled. And she sent him to Mexico to see the bishop to build her house at Tepeyac. Then the uncle manifested that it was true that on that occasion he became well and that he had seen her in the same manner as she had appeared to his nephew, knowing through her that he had sent, that she had sent him to Mexico to see the bishop. Also, the lady told him that when he would go see the bishop to reveal to him what he had seen and to explain the miraculous manner in which she had cured him and that she would probably properly be named and known as the blessed image, the ever virgin, holy Mary of Guadalupe. That's the accounts that we have of the apparition to Juan Diego of the Virgin Mary, as she becomes the Virgin of Guadalupe, um, honored and venerated and even worshiped in Mexico from the colonial period up until today and throughout Latin America also. Here's an image of the Basilica um, of Our Lady of Guadalupe at Tepeyac. Um, this is a large grounds area um, up here on the hill are the, is the older um, um, Basilica Church of Guadalupe and uh, other um, spiritual shrines and the modern Basilica here. And of course, it's always filled with, with, with um, pilgrims and, um, and those who venerate the Virgin Mary, devotees. Here inside of this Basilica, you're able to see the original. This is the original Tilema that was supposedly given to Juan Diego by the Virgin Mary, going back to 1531. This is one of, them, one of Mexico's and Latin America's most prized possessions is the Tilema of Guadalupe that you can go see yourself. Here's a, a, a casta painting. A ca casta paintings were a genre of artistic, artistic expression in the colonial period that began in Mexico City. 
that um, would that detailed the different types of racial mixtures occurring in the new world. Um, this is a whole different lecture on, um, on race mixing, on racial purity, on the seeds of modern racism that began in Spain and modern Mexico. But they, they are fascinating um, how um, um, this emerging Mexican culture, Spanish culture, um, had this anxiety about racial mixing and, and um, create a whole um, system of different variations and, and express them in paintings. Here's the Virgin Mary, um, the Virgin of Guadalupe in 1750, overseeing um, her peoples in the New World and in, in um, New Spain, these various combinations of races. And her banner has been used throughout Mexican history, throughout Latin American history, as an icon of power as she leads her, her people in various ways um, to fight um, autocracy and um, injustice. So we, we see her as a general during the, the, the conquest, as the Spanish believe they're fighting the devil. We see her banner used by um, the priest Hidalgo um, when he pushed for um, independence from Spain in 1810, as he yelled out, death to the Spaniards, and long live the Virgin of Guadalupe. And here is a painting of him by Antonio Fabres and um, depicting Hidalgo as he's making the, the cry, the grito in 1810. And we see the Virgin of Guadalupe here and her name, Guadalupe. Here is the, the original banner that you can, that, that, that is in Mexico City um, of, of the Virgin of Guadalupe used by Miguel Hidalgo in his insurgent army during the Mexican War of Independence, 1810. Here is a, rep a reproduction of the banner used by the Cristeros um, as they fought against the Mexican government and what they perceived as um, their oppression by the Mexican government. Um, Viva Cristo Rey y Nuestra Senora de Guadalupe. Long live Christ the King and Our Lady of Guadalupe used by the Cristeros as a symbol of power and as their general, the same in very similar ways as the Spanish used the, the Virgin Mary to conquer um, the Mexica and native peoples. Um, she's being used here in a, in a time of war, a time of conflict to protect her people and to give them a success in battles. Here's a, a photo of some Cristeros 1926, 1929, and the Virgin of Guadalupe back here. And of course, um, the UFW, Cesar Chavez, here's, here's Chavez right here. And here is one um, a UFW member carrying a banner very similar to Miguel Hidalgo's um, in 1971, UFW, Cesar Chavez and the Virgin on a march, of course. Here again is a photo of Cesar Chavez and the Virgin of Guadalupe in the background. The UFW used the Virgin of Guadalupe um, in very similar ways as, as the Cristeros and Miguel Hidalgo to, to lead the troops to fight injustice. Here's um, a painting by um, the Ch Chicana feminist painter, Yolanda Lopez, um, California native. This was painted in 1978. It's titled, Portrait of the Artist as a Virgin of Guadalupe. Another one of Yolanda Lopez's paintings representing the, the empowerment of Chicana and Mexican women as, as Guadalupe. Another one. And here is a young Yolanda Lopez in 1978 entitled Tableau vivant, right. the, living, the living painting. And here's another one of Yolanda Lopez's paintings um, where she represents um, an Aztec deity, Tonantzin, as Guadalupe without, without any type of um, European um, infusion, without the syncretic nature of um, Guadalupe, um, absent of any kind of European or Western influence, 
here is our mother, Nuestra Madre Tonansin in all her glory. Not Mary in any bit, only Tonansin. Another um, Chicana feminist professor, Alma Lopez, as Tonansin Guadalupe. Chicana Tonansin Guadalupe. And of course, um, Guadalupe fe is featured in many ways in Mexican and Chicano and Latino culture um, represented here as a tattoo. Protection, more tattoos. Of, here on the left is Guadalupe and on the right is um, Santa Muerte, Holy Death, represented in many ways as Guadalupe. Another Guadalupe tat. Guadalupe at a lowrider. Guadalupe at another lowrider. Guadalupe on a mural. Beautiful mural. I love this mural. Tucson, Arizona. Another mural. I, this is one of my fa favorite painters, Fabian Debora, um, who's a Los Angeles painter. And this one's called Mi Madre de, de Los Angeles. Obviously, Mary um, represented in, in this mural, but also a painting. Guadalupe and Malancin, the Virgin and the Traitor. All very powerful paintings. Here are a, a few photos that I took in 2019 when I visited um, Tenochtitlan, Mexico City. Here is a, a banner of Guadalupe being carried by a devotee as they wait in line to go into her, her modern basilica. You can see this building, this is not a, a, um, a camera defect. This building is leaning this way. Uh, many of the buildings, these old colonial buildings in Mexico City um, are either sinking into the ground or leaning or both because Mexico City was, was built upon a lake bed. And, and whenever there's an earthquake, um, it's, 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 it takes it very hard because it's not on stable ground. It's, built on a lake bed. So many of these buildings actually are sinking into the ground. Another photo I took of the inside of the, of the basilica. And here is the Tilma of Guadalupe. Oh, in front would be the priest, right? Here's a priest right here. I, no, that's a statue. But not that far in front would be the priest and then the worshipers. This is... Um, at Tepeyac on, on the Basilica grounds, um, it's, it's, it's a large um, park area that you can walk around and visit the various shrines and churches to Guadalupe that were built over the years. But this is supposed to be to have been the spot. This is the spot where she appeared to Juan Diego. And so there are statues here on this spot where she's said to have appeared. This is the actual Tepeyac spot. And here's a reproduction of her devotees coming to her during the colonial period. Now, Guadalupe in Mexico is, is the most famous of the Marian apparitions and cults in Latin America. But she, she, she is representative of a larger phenomenon throughout Latin America where the Virgin Mary is said to have appeared to the faithful throughout various countries in Latin America. And she takes, she's taken on the local flavor of, uh, uh, of the people in wherever she's appeared. So here is the Virgin Mary in Argentina, Our Lady of, Our Lady of Lujan. And these are all Mary. Now there are, other, there are other saints throughout Latin America that aren't Mary. They're, they have different names, but the, all the, uh, most of the female apparitions and cults in Latin America 
are um, the Virgin Mary in her various guises. Here is the Virgin Mary, the Virgin de Copa Cabana. In Ecuador, the Virgin Mary, here's the Pope. I'm visiting the Virgin Mary. Our Lady of Quinche. Here are some questions for us to consider as we wrap up our lecture. Why is Guadalupe such an important symbol to Mexicans, Chicanos, and Latinos throughout Latin America, even to this day? Refer back to our definition of culture. How does Guadalupe fit into Latin American culture? What role does she fill? That wraps up our lecture on the Virgin of Guadalupe. Perhaps you might wanna do your own research on this, this, um, this phenomena of the Virgin of Guadalupe. Thank you, students of Latin American history.